today in conjunction with the America First Policy Institute. I'm filing as the lead class representative a major class action lawsuit against the big tech giants, including Facebook, Google, and Twitter, as well as their CEOs, Mark Zuckerberg, Sundar Poche, and Jack Dorsey. Three real nice guys. We're asking the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida to order an immediate halt to social media companies' illegal, shameful censorship of the American people, and that's exactly what they are doing. We're demanding an end to the shadow banning, a stop to the silencing, and a stop to the blacklisting, banishing, and canceling that you know so well. Our case will prove this censorship is unlawful, it's unconstitutional, and it's completely un-American. We all know that. We all know that very, very well. Our filing also seeks injunctive relief to allow prompt restitution and really restoration and you can name about 20 other things, and it has to be prompt because it's destroying our country. Of my accounts, in addition, we are asking the court to impose punitive damages on these social media giants. We're going to hold big tech very accountable. This is the first of numerous other lawsuits, I assume, that would follow. But this is the lead, and I think it's going to be a very, very important game changer for our country. It will be a pivotal battle in the defense of the First Amendment. And in the end, I am confident that we will achieve a historic victory for American freedom and, at the same time, freedom of speech. Talking about that class action lawsuit, Alan Dershowitz, famed attorney, standing by live, just to kind of break this down for us. Alan, I know you listened to this in its entirety there, a class action lawsuit against Facebook, Google, Twitter, and their CEOs. What did you make of it? Well, as you know, I wrote a book about that exact subject, the case against the new censorship, protecting free speech from big tech. So I'm deeply involved in this issue, and I was also asked to be an expert witness, and I did submit an affidavit uh, for this lawsuit. So I'm not simply an observer. This is a very, very important lawsuit. What's going on with high tech is unacceptable. It's inconsistent with the spirit of free speech that underlies our First Amendment. This is a complicated case because, as the president pointed out, and as Pam Bondi pointed out, and as the others pointed out, uh, these are not just ordinary private companies. They have special exemptions under Section 230, uh, and therefore they partake of some kind of government action. And the courts will have to parse this issue. How much of what they do is private? How much of what they do partakes of being public? What we don't want is the government telling private companies what they can say and what they can do. That would be wrong. But we don't want these quasi-public, enormous, monopolistic companies to be restricting our free speech. The current situation is unacceptable. And this lawsuit, I think, will shake things up considerably, though I can't predict in the end how it will come out. Professor, let me ask you about this, because they invited folks that may feel that they were censored by big tech to join in on this class action lawsuit. They gave the website to do yeah. so. Could this be yeah. a news story in itself of how many people might be a part of this lawsuit all said and oh, done? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Look, I was censored. I had a debate with Bobby Kennedy. Here are two liberals. I'm a liberal Democrat who voted for Joe Biden. Uh, he's a liberal Democrat whose father was the attorney general of the United States. We were arguing uh, uh, about um, vaccinations and mandatory vaccinations, and uh, uh, YouTube took it down. They said, essentially, we're happy to have you listen to Dershowitz as part of the debate, but we don't want you to hear Bobby Kennedy's part of the debate. And uh, in the end, um, thousands of people who wanted to see our debate couldn't see it. So I think many of us are victimized by this kind of uh, censorship. And um, there will be people who will join this. It will be very interesting to see how the courts deal with this. This is a complicated and difficult case. It's not a simple case, because there is an argument about private companies. 
And then the argument on the other side is they're, they're not really private, and the courts are going to have to resolve that. There is some precedent on that. There's a case called Marsh versus Alabama, where a company town, a town owned by a company, forbade free speech, and the Supreme Court said no. Although it's owned by a company, it partakes of the public, and therefore the First Amendment applies. So we're going to have to see how the courts resolve this very complicated, very interesting case. If I was still teaching at Harvard, I could teach an entire course yeah. just case. Let me ask you two things. Uh, but one, according to the legal team that we saw earlier, uh, one of the attorneys brought up prior restraint cited the Pentagon Papers. I wanted to bring that up if that, if that plays a role. Plus, location, yes. being in South Florida, the courts there. Good, your thoughts? Two good points. Look, I was one of the lawyers in the Pentagon Papers case. I represented Senator Gravel in front of the United States Supreme Court. I believe very strongly that prior restraint is wrong. Clearly, what's happening here is prior restraint. That is, they're telling the former president of the United States, we don't want you on our platforms, no matter what you say. We're going to restrain you. So the issue is not so much prior restraint. I think everybody will acknowledge this is prior restraint. It's whether or not the prior restrainer is subject to the First Amendment or himself has a First Amendment right. That's what's so complicated about this. That's why I call this the new censorship. The old censorship involved pure government, McCarthyism, Congress. Today, we have these companies are the new censors. Southern Florida is picked tactically, um, obviously, because it has judges on both sides of the political spectrum. It's not New York. Um, and uh, I think that was a decision mm -hmm. that was the and to maximize the chances of getting what they regard as a fair hearing. All right. Well, let's kick it off today. Uh, President Trump and legal team announcing that, bringing the lawsuit there against the CEOs of Twitter, Google, Facebook, as well as the companies. Alan Dershowitz joining us live there with his reaction. Good to see you, Alan. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Senator? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I, put, I chose you. Go ahead, please. What, are, what is the possibility of a settlement prior to trial? Because obviously any court ruling in your favor, and you've laid out a very compelling case, anything prior to a court ruling would certainly limit the rest, the, everybody else who's not in the class. We're what not looking for a settlement. We don't expect a settlement. Uh, they fight, and they fight hard. She, they've never had anything like this, and they've never had a team of uh, very attractive-looking people in every way. Look at that. That's, a, that's a, quite a legal team. That's like from a picture. But they are a very effective, much more importantly, legal team. So we're not looking to settle. We don't know what's going to happen, but we're not looking to settle. Thank but, you, Christina. Thank you, sir. Yeah, please, go ahead. President. So we are talking about privately held companies that have been censoring. How, what's your position on public broadcasting, NPR, who also to be, seem to be filling the same kind of role for a certain It's, it's private... such a great question. They are terrible. They are terrible. And it's not only what they say, it's what they don't say. For instance, uh, I was informed that uh, there are record numbers of murders took place this weekend, record numbers. They don't even talk about it on NBC and uh, CBS and ABC and NPR. They don't talk about it, and it's a, big, it's a big story. That's why the credibility of the mainstream media is the lowest it's ever been, the lowest it's ever been. I, and, you know, I hate to take credit for this, but I'm very proud of the fact that I expose them for what they are. They are terrible, terrible representatives of our country. They don't talk about crime. They don't talk about Chicago, where you had 260 people shot this weekend. That's in Afghanistan. You know, we didn't lose one soldier in the last more than a year. And I will say that was largely because of me, but I won't take credit, but the good news is I will never be given credit either. But uh, we haven't lost a soldier. Think of it, 260 people shot in Chicago, massive numbers of people shot in New York, and they don't prosecute these people. These are killers. They don't prosecute these people. They have no process. They only go after Republicans. It's a terrible thing that's happening in our country and a very dangerous uh, thing and a very good question. Please, please, Rob. How you doing? Uh, how do you fight the argument that these are private companies? They can be as liberal as they want to be. Well, they say that they're private, but they're no longer private. If they gave up their Section 230 
liability protection, I would go along with them. I'd say they're private. We'll open up other privates. And other privates will be opened up. I mean, I know that for a fact because I'm involved in that. But I will say that they are, they have Section 230. It's a liability protection, the likes of which nobody in the history of our country has ever received, just a small group. And we're not going to stand for it. And that makes them, in my opinion, very subject to the kind of penalties that we're talking about, which is potentially, John, trillions of dollars. It's a, a number that, uh, the likes of which nobody's seen before. John, you might want to address that. The Supreme Court over the years, especially recently, has been very clear what you can and can't do as a private company. And they've done it all. There's mainly three reasons. The president has talked about uh, the immunity. There's also the coercion by the, uh, Congress, congressmen, congresswomen, and, uh, in the media and in testimony and in their tweets. And there's, there's also the fact that this law, when this law was passed, Zuckerberg was in middle school, okay? It has served its purpose. It's the, you know, it's, now it has grown into this monster that Congress never intended. And the real bottom line is Congress cannot delegate what it can't do itself. And that's what they've done. You know, we were talking earlier about when 230 was created in 1996. And really, I believe one of the main reasons was something we all care deeply about, but as a former attorney general, um, getting the sex predators off instantly. Yet today, there are still, and this may have come out during the, the congressional testimony, but there are still, there were over 16 million reports still of sex predators, of sex exploitation of children online, 45 million photos and videos that are allegedly still out there. That's what they need to be focusing on. Thank you, Mr. President. I think the timing of this is perfect, especially going to the midterms and looking ahead to 2024. Can you share your thoughts on the timing of it and how that, this decision can help protect conservative viewpoints as we move further to 2024 elections? The timing just seemed to be right because they've been so abusive, so bad, what they've done, not only to the President of the United States, but to so many others. Uh, Hamas has a site. The greatest killers in the world have a site. They're never reprimanded. They're never red flagged. They're never, nothing ever happens. The president, and you, again, get the quote. You won't believe it. But these people call for the destruction of Israel, the destruction of the USA. Nothing happens to them. And I just think it's become so flagrant and so outrageous and outrageously ridiculous that this was a good time. Not having to do with the elections. Uh, I think this will go on beyond the elections. I would be surprised if it didn't. But I think it's a very important thing for our nation. Very, very important. Yeah, please. Go ahead, please. Just to clarify, um, who should be the arbiter of what's hate, what's offensive, what should not be uh, published, what goes beyond free speech? And because so much of this, uh, your banning, has to do with uh, comments you made around January 6th, uh, just to clarify further, what did you do to stop the insurrection, as some people call it, and why were you not able to stop it? So that whole uh, event, unfortunate event, just went through Congress and a report was issued and my name wasn't even mentioned. And I appreciate that. I was surprised, frankly, because I would have assumed that they would have come up with their typically biased, at least on the Democrat side, statement. Uh, the report came out, as you saw, two weeks ago. My name wasn't even mentioned. That was an unfortunate event. Uh, I say, though, however, people are being treated unbelievably unfairly when you look at people in prison and nothing happens to Antifa. Mm -hmm. And they burned down cities and killed people. There were no guns in the Capitol. They burned, except for the gun that shot Ashley Babbitt. And nobody knows who that man were. If that were the opposite way, that man would be all over. He would be the, the most well-known, and I believe, I can say man, because I believe I know exactly who it is. But he would be the most well-known person in this country, in the world, but the person that shot Ashley Babbitt 
boom, right through the head, just boom. There was no reason for that. And why isn't that person being opened up? And why isn't that being studied? They've already written it off. They said, that case is closed. If that were the opposite, that case would be going on for years and years, and it would not be pretty. So I just thought this was a very important time. Yeah, please, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Twitter, if you're successful on this, and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all the social media platforms let you back on and let everyone else back on uninhibited the way that everybody ha everyone's supposed to have access, would you use their platforms again? I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. I might not. You know, I, I'm in a different position because if I put out a press release, you know, I'm getting extremely good pickup. But that's me. The world, everybody that's getting banned is, they can't put out a press release. People would say, who the hell is that? Nobody's going to pick it up. And even myself, I could instantaneously get the word out. If somebody says a lie, like the fake media, I can at least give the opposing side, which I've been doing for six years. I used to get great publicity before I ran for office, okay? I've been doing this for five or six years where I can get a word out, an opposing word. Today, you can't do that. They took away the rights of, in my opinion, the majority. I really believe it's the majority because people aren't for all of these things. Now they have voter ID. That's another one when you talk about voter ID. All of a sudden, they love voter ID. They fought it vehemently. I noticed two days ago, I watched a congressman happened to be from South Carolina, say, no, I've always been in favor of voter ID. Well, he hasn't, because you look at his statement for the last two years. He's been vehemently opposed. But now, they lie like nobody has ever lied. I watched him say, I've always believed in voter ID, essentially. And I said, that's unbelievable. Fortunately, the particular newscast had his statements from before, of which they were too numerous to put up, but they put up enough of them. But the Democrats are now saying, because they saw it was an 88 percent positive issue, they're now saying, we believe in voter ID. We have to have voter ID. They have ne there isn't one Democrat in the country that said that. And in a year from now, the fake news will say they've always been on this side. It's amazing. If you say it long enough, hard enough, often enough, people will start to believe it. That's what happened with Russia. That's what happened with Ukraine. That's what happened with, well, the worst is when they don't say it, like the laptop from hell. They didn't want to, you look at that thing, that is, there is more criminal activity on that laptop than Al Capone had, if he ever had a laptop. Would like to give Al Capone one, but he was a baby compared to what I was able to see. Brooke, would you like to say a few more words? Yeah. One question, how can somebody join the lawsuit? That's a good question, Brooke. Uh, that you can join the lawsuit by going to takeonbigtech.com. I did not plant that question, but I very much appreciate it. Uh, takeonbigtech.com, and we really are looking for the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans. And let me just say one quick thing. It was a great question about the political ramifications of this lawsuit versus two years or four years, and certainly it will be part of the national narrative, I think, moving forward for the next couple of years. But this effort really is about the battle for the future of this country. And when we lose the opportunity to be part of a public discourse, whether as conservatives, as Republicans, as libertarians, as fighting against critical race theory, as questioning masks and whether our 11, 13, 15, and 16-year-olds, my children, should be forced to wear a mask all day, whether we're questioning uh, illegal immigration and how to use it, that's crazy, and it's not okay, and this is not America, and it is not the America that I know we all want for our children and our future grandchildren, and that's what this lawsuit is about. We have the best legal team in the country. The America First Policy Institute is partnering with them to ensure that the word gets out, that we can truly, truly give our Americans who have been censored, who have been compromised, who have been told that they don't have a voice, that will no longer be the case. So thank you. Thank you all. I want to make one thing, gentlemen asked, who would decide what's hate speech? Who would decide this thing? For 200 years, over 200 years, it's been the Supreme Court. We can't let it be in the hands of unelected people or unappointed justices, but they have done such a good job for 200 years on this issue. We don't need any panels. We don't need any oversight committees. 
we need the Supreme Court and the judicial, the judicial system to come into the 21st century. All right, so I want to thank everybody. It's about 94 degrees out. I'm sorry to do this. It was supposed to be a beautiful day, and 72 and perfect, and it's a little bit hot. Uh, we're going to have refreshment drinks. We'll bring you into the clubhouse if you'd like, but uh, we'll take care of you because I see some of you are in serious trouble sitting there. Uh, I, do, I do hope uh, I can leave you with two things. Number one, this is a very important lawsuit. This is a big time, uh, long awaited, very, very long awaited. The complexity of it, I guess, took a longer period of time, but uh, other litigants also want to join in with us. And we have great confidence in the courts, and we're going to see what happens. And the other thing I just ask the uh, mainstream media to go back and do on network news and everywhere else is please discuss the horrors of what's going on in our, in all cases, Democrat-run cities. The hundreds and hundreds of people that are being killed on a weekly and monthly basis so that people will do something about it. But you're not talking about it. You're not helping Biden. You're not helping the Democrats. You're hurting the country. So I hope you can go out and just talk about the crime. Say 260 people were shot in Chicago. It's a number. It's a stat put out by the city over the weekend. There's no war that we lost that many and for a long time. And, and many people died, young people. And New York is a horror show. New York has the worst crime wave that they've had ever. And nothing's done about it except no bail. They let everybody out of prison. They just left almost 500 people out. They let them all out. They caused tremendous damage and harm and physical harm to other people and death. And they let them out. If the people don't hear this, you'll never be able to solve the problem. It's a problem like this country has never had. What's happened over the last six months in particular and what's happening in certain cities uh, is a horrible thing. It's an embarrassment to our country. But more importantly, it's just a horrible thing. The loss of human life on a weekly basis, and you turn on these major newscasts that a lot of people are watching, and it's not even mentioned. You have to change. you, you got to get your credibility back. You don't have the credibility. You have to get it back. I want to thank everybody very much, and we'll be seeing what happens. John, good luck. Pam, good luck. Everybody, uh, Trish, I want to thank you for being so great. You're really fantastic. I appreciate it very much. You've been so incredible. Thank you. And thank you to everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>